Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. So welcome to our Head to Toe podcast as we travel around the body. My name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the college's heritage manager and librarian. And I'm Olivia Howarth and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we have made it as far as the lungs. And I apologise, but it feels like every single podcast episode we have started in the same place. But we are going to have to start with humoral theory because you cannot get away from it. It's everywhere in the history of medicine. So the lungs are one of the very key parts of humoral theory. There are four organs of the body that are completely central to this early modern or or pre-modern understanding of how medicine works. So because there are four humours in the body, yellow bile, black bile, blood and phlegm, these four humours are produced by four different organs, the spleen, the gallbladder, the liver and the lungs. So the lungs is on one of those lists of like kind of top four key body parts central to all the ideas around humoral theory, even though they didn't really understand what the lungs did or what they were for. They understood that they were important and slightly sadly for the lungs, they are in many ways the worst of the organs because they produce phlegm, which creates cold and moist temperaments, which are associated with being a bit dim and a bit boring and not being particularly impressive or intelligent or exciting in any way. So apparently that's what the lungs do. And lungs are also viewed in a very literal way as well. So the heart is heating the body, lungs are cooling the body, like, you know, a set of bellows firing, but then cooling the body. So again, a very literal role. But it's fascinating to me that the four organs are liver, lungs, spleen and gallbladder, because liver and lungs makes complete sense to me as main character organs. But the heart isn't on that list. But the spleen and the gallbladder are, which feel like in in 21st century understanding of the body, not your kind of top key organs necessarily. Mm. But the heart is not on that list in terms of kind of creating the, the, the humours. So you get into the Renaissance and there's, you know, and this applies not just to lungs, but I guess to kind of all body parts that they begin to be illustrated beautifully. So people have a real understanding of the the physicality, the structure of the lungs, but there's still a lack of understanding of how they work. So we know exactly what they look like, but what they actually do is slightly another matter. One of the things that we get um, a lot in the college when we get out you know, various books to, to show people is that the surgeons are always amazed by how close so many of the books are to what they see now. Obviously, you know, there are changes in printing styles, but some of the depictions of the lungs or the liver are you know, almost identical to what they are currently using in their kind of teaching. But the real sort of understanding of the role of the lungs comes slightly later in the 1600s with uh, the English physician, William Harvey. And Harvey is particularly associated for a lot of people with cardiology, with his understanding of the heart. Obviously, part of understanding the heart is understanding circulation and how that works in general. So understanding of the lungs is all tied in with understanding the heart. It's how blood, how oxygen function in the body. So so the understanding of the lungs really kind of comes through with, with William Harvey. And, and I suppose another sort of major step is the development of the stethoscope. So that ability to not see inside, but to hear inside the body, and particularly hearing the lungs is obviously hugely important for kind of understanding. So that's the, the early 1800s. It's a, a French physician, René Lenet. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. I am terrible at pronunciation. But exactly why he developed it is slightly sort of one of the arguments is because it's just this discomfort with getting close to a woman's body, which quite possibly is the case. But it might also be that this is just literally a better way of doing it than putting your ear against somebody's chest. And he very, very quickly developed a chart 
of the different noises that you should listen for, for different complaints. So you could, a certain noise in the lungs was pneumonia, a different noise was emphysema. And he very, very quickly figured out that he, how well you could use that for understanding. Did he um, specifically design the stethoscope for diagnosing lung conditions then? Because I think the classical thing people think of when they're playing doctor is like, oh, let's listen to your heart. The very first case that he used it for was the heart. And it was a very specific case uh, of a woman that he was treating. But he realised that actually you could get more out of it in terms of the lungs. Most of his research and certainly the tables of data and things were, were related to the lungs. The, the kind of Victorian idea of a change of air has always been around and people recommending going to the seaside. So sanatoriums were quite often next to the sea. Sea air was one of the things in places of high altitude. So there were a lot of sanatoriums in Switzerland or also in the desert because dry and hot seemed to be recommended for lungs as well. I did not know that about the desert. Those are the three kind of geographical locations that it was argued had the best fresh air or the best air quality for people with lung complaints. I think in Britain, the seaside, it had already been a place of respite or health cure because of the Georgian fascination with sea cures. Well, and also, you know, it's, it's yeah, you want to keep keep all the punters coming back to your seaside resort. There's people who have a vested interest in this <laughs> <laughs> working out economically. Another sort of major thing that people think of when they think of lungs is, of course, the iron lung. Um, so just to start off by very, very quickly explaining in case anybody isn't familiar with them, an iron lung, it's, some books I've read describe them as coffin-like, which is particularly gruesome, I think, but they are human-sized cylinders which are designed to simulate breathing for people whose illness um, means that they can't breathe by themselves. So it was developed by a team at Harvard University, and I think it was first used in the 1920s. People tend to particularly associate iron lungs with polio, but they were also used for any other complaint where you could not really breathe for yourself. You know, they have to be um, airtight. That's how they function, because the space raises and lowers the air pressure in you know and therefore your lungs are forced to to um, take in oxygen as a result there, there's a, a slight sort of um misunderstanding perhaps in the in the way in which iron lungs operated iron lungs were typically used for a relatively short period of time days weeks maybe months there are a a small number of cases of people who had to use them for their entire lives but that wasn't the norm that's not what people expected i think i've read that um typically people who had polio would only be in them for about two weeks mm. whilst they recovered i think i had an image of what they looked like and then had no concept about how they worked and it's fascinating that it's like the opposite of what current ventilators do ventilators have positive pressure so they're blowing things into the lungs but iron lungs have negative it's a negative pressure ventilation system they look very steampunk they do because they've got sort of like ships portholes all along them i mean they're not ships they're iron lung portholes but you know it's that sort of aesthetic because you needed to be able to open them to put things in or take things out you couldn't just have like one Hatch. You had to have them all the way along so you could get in and get to somebody's foot or whatever without opening up the whole thing. So, yeah, there is a, a very sort of um, a, an aesthetic that we wouldn't be used to with kind of 21st century medicine, for sure. But no, and I'm just trying to think in terms of iron lungs in pop culture, because I feel like, you know, quite a few years ago, 20 whatever years ago, I remember seeing a lot of films and TV shows where an iron lung would be included. And I feel like there's at least one bad daytime murder mystery thing where somebody like unplugged some millionaire's iron lung and oh, who did it sort of thing. It was sort of a, a, a plot device that was used at one point. I guess culturally it resonated in the 80s and 90s maybe more than it does today because we are that bit further removed from from that part of history. That was a fear that did resonate because it's the idea that you are so reliant on this plug socket or the electricity in this building, you know, the the, the potential for things to go wrong if there's a power cut. 
mm. was something that was particularly unsettling around this. When you talk about the lungs, there are certain diseases that get in the history get talked about quite a lot. So tuberculosis slash consumption is definitely one of them. Lung cancer is another one. Asthma. I got very excited about asthma. I guess the first thing is that like a lot of historical terms that have been around for a long time, in this case, back to ancient Greece, it does not at all mean in the history what it means now. Asthma now is a very specific complaint caused by very specific particles. In history, it was just like, oh, you've got a bit of a cough or a wheeze or something weird going on. Let's call it asthma. You can't really say that it's the same thing 2000 years ago for what it is now. But one of my favourite things, favourite not in a good way, about asthma is that it's consistently for thousands of years been treated by smoking in one form or another. That's pretty much always been one of the key treatments until relatively recently. As a lifelong asthmatic, that was a major uh, mind-blowing moment for me when I read that. I found one advert in particular for something called Joy Cigarettes, which claim to cure asthma. And they said that they afford immediate relief in the cases of asthma, wheezing and winter cough. Agreeable to use, certain in their effects and harmless in their action. They may be safely smoked by ladies and children. Even pre-tobacco coming over to Europe, people were smoking various different herbs or types of narcotics to treat, inverted commas there, the, the asthma or, or the kind of uh, the, the breathing problems that they were having. And a big innovation in asthma treatment was in the Georgian period in the late 1700s, a guy called John Mudge, who um, published a book which included a diagram of a sort of modified beer tankard with a lid where you attached a little straw. And it was basically for inhaling vapours, which is much more close to some of the more modern treatments. Um, And the way it works is you pour hot water into the tankard, you close the lid and you breathe in the steam through this, this straw, this opening. I should say that his version was mostly opium. So that's what you are inhaling is a very strong opiate. Again, don't try this at home, but that was his recommendation as a cure for asthma. As an asthmatic, have you ever tried opium? I have not tried opium. Um, I had a wee look into some of the other treatments for asthma and it's all the drugs as well. I can't picture how inhaling tar or turpentine is going to help. I, I am not a medical doctor. I do not have those credentials. However, I just feel like tar mixed with opium may not actually be the solution. I'm willing to be overruled. Uh, One remedy I found, a much earlier remedy from from sort of ancient Greek times, was drinking or inhaling hot owl's blood. Uh, Don't ask me for the science. (laughs) It's another time owls have come up. I don't know if that's an indication of how prolific, how many owls there were. I'm not an expert at all on that time period, but I definitely feel when I read later recipes, Scottish chapbooks, that they weigh on the side of things that are common. So there's a lot of recipes involving herrings or pigeons or nettles. And you think, okay, well, what they're doing is they're recommending things that people can just find around them. Were there a lot of owls in ancient Greece? In our case study today, we're going to look at the early history of tobacco smoking in Britain. Tobacco first arrived on the European continent around 1560. It was under cultivation in England by 1570, and its use spread quickly through society. Nicholas Menardes, a Spanish physician and botanist, was the first physician to write about the medicinal use of tobacco. He described over 65 diseases which he claimed it could cure, His text was so influential that it led to the idea that tobacco could cure all diseases and conditions. It introduced to Europe the words tobacco and nicotine and started a controversy as the medical world was split over the benefits or harmful effects of the tobacco plant. Another physician, Giles Everard from the Netherlands, added to Menardes's list to such an extent that tobacco came to be regarded by many as the great universal medicine. Everard even implied that it was such a cure-all that there would be less need for physicians. Everard wrote in 1659 that, quote, It is no great friend to physicians, 
though it be a physic plant, for the very smoke of it is held to be a great antidote against all venom and pestilential diseases. In spite of publications like this, in reality the use of tobacco was from the outset as much, if not more, about fashion than about health. Caricatures of dandies or gallants as they were called, ostentatious smoking and the purchasing of expensive smoking equipment were all commonplace. One author wrote in 1603 that the sign of a fashionable gentleman was, quote, to make good faces, to take tobacco well, to spit well, to lie well, and to blush for nothing. By 1620, there was a society of tobacco pipe smokers which had been incorporated by royal charter, and those who wanted to excel at smoking would learn the latest techniques of inhaling and exhaling, Indeed, adverts could be found in newspapers and apothecary shops for self-titled professors who would teach tricks such as exhaling rings of smoke and which accoutrements were the most fashionable. But this idea that smoking was positive, both fashionable and a type of medicine, was definitely not universal. Eliza Duncan was one of the first physicians to write about the harmful effects of smoking tobacco. In an attack on quacks and unqualified physicians in 1606, he warned that, quote, Doth not tobacco then threaten a short life to the great takers of it? He concluded with a special warning that it was so hurtful and dangerous to youth that it might just as well be known by the name of youth's bane as by the name of tobacco. The tobacco controversy became so heated that even the king became involved. King James VI denied that this vile custom had any medical value whatsoever. By using logic and the medical knowledge of the time, King James challenged many of the claims that were being made. The filthy smoke, he wrote, makes a kitchen also oftentimes in the inward parts of men, soiling and infecting them with an unctuous and oily kind of soot, as hath been found in some great takers, that after their death their bodies were opened. He also referred to its addictiveness, whereby the smoker is piece by piece allured until he craves it like a drunkard will have as great a thirst to be drunk. The king concluded with the view that it was, quote, a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs. This short clip is from the Welcome Collection. It is part of a Central Office of Information film for the Ministry of Health, and it first aired in 1950. Two sisters work in this factory. Joan has a job in the workroom. Betty is the manager's secretary. Recently, she has been feeling thoroughly run down and doing her work badly. The manager, suspecting that ill health is the trouble, advises her to see a doctor. She tells her sister Joan but she says she's going to take no notice of this advice. Betty is reluctant to go because two years ago, her mother died of tuberculosis and she is afraid she may have inherited the disease. Joan eventually persuades her. Tuberculosis is not hereditary, although you can be infected by someone who has it. The doctor tells her this when he examines her. He finds her a bit anemic, otherwise there's nothing much wrong. All the same, he wants her to be x-rayed. This is the only certain method of detecting tuberculosis in its early stages. Then he asks Joan how long she's had her cough, and after examining her also, advises both sisters to go and have an X-ray taken. Under the National Health Scheme, this service continues to be provided free. Soon, Betty can see the result of the X-ray for herself. Her lungs are perfectly healthy, and she needn't worry any more. Now it's Joan's turn. Having an X-ray is short and simple, almost as easy as taking a snapshot. Let's have a look at Joan's X-ray. That patch on her lung is evidence of tuberculosis. The doctor knows what a shock this is for Joan, but because it's been detected at this stage, she's got every chance of getting well soon. For a time, however, she will have to go into a sanatorium. Although new forms of treatment are bringing added hope, proper food and rest and plenty of fresh air remain the essentials for the cure of tuberculosis. As soon as Joan arrives at the sanatorium, she starts having treatment. Here you see how it's done. The diseased part of the lung is shown black, for this part to get better, the lung must be rested by a method called artificial pneumothorax, or lung rest. To do this, 
A needle is put painlessly through the wall of the chest, but not, of course, into the lung itself. Air from the outside is let in so that the lung collapses. This lung will now be able to rest while the other does the work of both. This is all done under a local anaesthetic and doesn't worry Joan at all. The diseased lung will now have a chance to heal. But there are not enough nurses to staff all the beds in hospitals for the tuberculosis patients needing them. So there remain some, less lucky than Joan, who must at present await their turn for a bed. For these people, a cure begins with home care. At home, the tuberculosis health visitor comes regularly to talk over with the family any problems caused by this patient's illness. Complete rest under his doctor's supervision is the quickest way to recovery. John Harvey has learned how to rest in bed and find an outlet for his creative energy. He took up painting six months ago, having something to do like painting, needlework, or even studying a new language or working for an exam is essential to keep patients happy and therefore help their cure. Joan has been in hospital several months now and the infected part of her lung is beginning to heal. Later, the lung itself will be allowed to expand again and only a small scar will remain. Already, she is able to get up and sit out of doors. The day comes when Betty can take her home again. Joan can now mix freely with other people and while she is getting back her strength, her local health authority will arrange for her to have special care. It won't be long before she can return to work and lead a normal life once again. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Often with internal organs, it can be quite difficult to be sure which body part is being prescribed for. A lot of recipes are to treat things like a pain inside or an inward wound. Lungs are usually a bit easier than many others, though, given the one particular symptom of difficulty breathing. But as with all historical recipes, the treatments aren't always quite what you might expect. So a text called Taylor's Ready Doctor, dated from 1785, prescribes her asthma, quote, blister behind the neck, betwixt the shoulders. For blocked lungs, the same text prescribes a young woman's milk, and for inflamed lungs, it recommends honey, common tar, and starch made into pills. A Scottish recipe book, John Moncrief's Poor Man's Physician, recommends for blocked lungs licorice and aniseed combined with sugar candy made into a powder. Moncrief recommends for a cough, quote, Take a handful of figs and steep them in ale until they become somewhat tender. Then set them asunder and put them in a linen bag, and so lay them on your stomach warm, and when they become cold, warm them in the same liquor and apply them to your stomach as formerly. Moncrief also recommends, this time for a consumption of the lungs, quote, cause the patient eat nothing but raisins with bread and drink the decoction of barley and licorice. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, click like, or leave a positive review or comment. We really appreciate it because it helps us get higher in the rankings and reach more people. Thank you.